Hello everyone, it's Eric from Strong Medicine. Today, in honor of the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission, when humans first stepped foot on the moon, I'm talking about space medicine. How our body responds to the microgravity experienced during space flight, the medical risks of space flight, and how astronauts, scientists, and engineers help to mitigate those risks. There are many aspects to space medicine, but today I'm going to focus on four. The effect of microgravity on the vestibular system, the cardiovascular system, and the musculoskeletal system, and the effect of radiation in space. Humans have evolved over millions of years within an environment with a consistent gravitational field. With the exception of skydiving, high diving, or amusement park rides, we never experience weightlessness that lasts more than a fraction of a second. And not only has our physiology evolved to operate within Earth's gravitational field, it actually depends on gravity to function normally. If the effects of gravity are taken away, things start to go wrong pretty quickly. And one of the first places is the vestibular system, leading to a condition called space motion sickness, with symptoms of nausea, vomiting, headache, and decreased appetite. It affects the majority of astronauts and lasts 12 to 72 hours. Interestingly, it was not experienced by astronauts in the Mercury or Gemini programs, which is believed to be due to the fact that these astronauts remained strapped into their chairs for their entire missions. In addition to the motion sickness symptoms, the lack of gravity-dependent vestibular input to the brain also leads to impaired hand-eye coordination and visual tracking in the first several days of weightlessness which seems kind of like a bad thing to experience when you're flying a spacecraft. Another aspect of space medicine is the effect on the cardiovascular system. Within minutes of exposure to microgravity, fluid, which usually pools in our legs on Earth, shifts from the periphery into the central circulation and the head. This leads to facial puffiness and a headache, and the increased venous return to the heart convinces the kidneys that there is an abundance of water so a diuresis is triggered for a few days until the body reaches a new weight and a new baseline of total body water, which is fine as long as the person stays in microgravity. Another response to microgravity is a reversible decline in barrel receptor responsiveness to positional changes in blood pressure, which is that reflex that prevents you from fainting every time you stand up. The combination of decreased barrel receptor function and relative hypovolemia with a possible contribution from altered cerebrovascular autoregulation, predictably leads to something called orthostatic intolerance, which astronauts experience upon returning to Earth. They get lightheaded when walking around because their body has temporarily lost the ability to respond to blood pooling in the legs. Now, when they come back to Earth, it's not a huge problem because astronauts can slowly increase activity as tolerated. After all, being an astronaut who just returned to Earth you probably get a pass on mowing the lawn for a few weeks. But what if the astronaut doesn't return to Earth, but is actually heading to Mars, where immediately upon landing, they'll need to perform intensive, mission-critical tasks? If they're too dizzy to stand up, it's not a minor inconvenience, but rather an emergency that could risk the lives of everyone there. Now this can be partially mitigated by interventions like oral loading with a salty fluid shortly before landing, the use of vasoconstricting medications, or even suits that can pressurize the legs differently than the rest of the body. However, these are not perfect solutions, and this remains a potential issue for which scientists will need a solution before we have people landing on Mars. So why was this not an issue on the moon? It's partially due to the relative strength of gravity on different planetary bodies. Astronauts on the surface of the moon only experience 0.17 Gs, while those on Mars would experience 0.38 Gs. But also, it took the Apollo missions several days to travel between Earth and the Moon, which is enough for some of these hemodynamic changes to have taken effect. But the trip to Mars may take longer than six months, which is long enough for a person's cardiovascular system to reach a variety of completely new stable baselines. Next, 
let's talk about what happens to astronauts' muscles and bones in low gravity. As you might guess, it's nothing good. In the absence of needing to lift our bodies against gravity, muscles start to atrophy, particularly the postural muscles in the abdomen, pelvis, and back. This can start to happen surprisingly quickly. And it's not just the skeletal muscles that atrophy in space, but the heart too. Decreased cardiac muscle mass, as determined by MRI, pre versus post space flight, has been observed to occur after only 10 days in space. The most effective way to prevent muscle atrophy while in space is exercise, both resistance and aerobic. There are a number of interesting solutions to the challenges with creating load-bearing exercise in a weightless environment, with the bungee-assisted treadmill one of the more intuitive employed. As a general rule, astronauts during prolonged flight are asked to exercise two hours a day. The skeleton doesn't fare any better than the muscles. Prolonged weightlessness leads to decreased bone mineralization, a process known as disuse osteoporosis. This is particularly prominent in the spine, pelvis, and femurs. One effect of bone demineralization is the excess excretion of calcium into the urine, leading to an increased risk of kidney stones, which has happened to at least one astronaut while in space. Having observed how painful kidney stones can be, I can imagine that was a bit of a problem. Lack of gravity also leads to a lengthening of the vertebral spine. While it might seem cool initially to be temporarily an inch or two taller, lengthening your back leads to back pain, and when intervertebral discs are no longer experiencing compressive force, they may be at an increased risk of herniation. Now, what about the radiation? That's also a big problem, at least for long-term missions. Space is full of harmful radiation from many different sources, while on Earth, we're protected from some radiation by the magnetosphere, the region above the Earth in which the planet's own magnetic field redirects solar wind from the surface. Otherwise, solar wind from the sun would destroy the ozone layer, leaving us all susceptible to ultraviolet radiation. As astronauts leave the ground, they are initially within a zone of protection, and most missions, such as those to the International Space Station, remain within that zone. But for missions to the moon or beyond, when the astronauts reach about 400 miles or sometimes more above the surface, they reach the first of two Van Allen belts. These belts are zones around the Earth in which the magnetosphere traps energetic charged particles from the solar wind. Passing through the Van Allen belts represents some risk to astronauts as they will receive a non-negligible dose of radiation here, but if they're able to avoid the most dangerous sections, the radiation will remain well below the level of likely harm. After all, several Apollo missions pass through the belts on the way to the moon and back again without any immediate or known long-term effects. It's when astronauts get beyond the magnetosphere and start spending longer and longer periods of time in space that radiation becomes a bigger problem. First, there are galactic cosmic rays, which are composed of high-energy protons and atomic nuclei that predominantly originate from outside the solar system and which would constantly bombard any spacecraft. The effects of cosmic rays on humans is very poorly understood, as this form of radiation is not seen on Earth in any significant quantity, but they almost certainly increase cancer risk. Even with conventional shielding, cosmic rays will still be a limiting factor for interplanetary travel in the future. For example, NASA's current lifetime limit for radiation risk for its astronauts is exceeded by that anticipated by a single mission to Mars. There is also the radiation from solar events like coronal mass ejections, which are relatively brief and rare, but which can transmit much, much higher doses of radiation, potentially high enough to cause lethal acute radiation sickness. While the risk of being hit by such an event during a single 10-day trip to the moon is very low, it becomes significantly more of a concern during a six-month trip to Mars. One proposed solution of sorts is to designate a specific part of the ship as a storm shelter, in which the entire crew would wait out the event in a small space with unusually robust shielding. There are many other medical considerations in space. For example, the G-forces experienced during takeoff and landing, as well as vibrations and noise, can lead to physical discomfort. There are limited supplies and expertise on board a spacecraft in the event of a medical emergency. 
depending on the size of the ship and the length and scope of the mission. An astronaut can likely be treated for minor traumas and common ailments. But if someone has a heart attack or a stroke, or if their appendix ruptures halfway to Mars, they are obviously out of luck. And there is a whole other category of psychiatric and psychosocial considerations ranging from poor sleep due to disruption of circadian rhythms to stressful interpersonal dynamics. What we know about space medicine so far is based on either assumptions from first principles, suboptimal experiments on Earth involving water immersion, prolonged bed rest, freefall parabolic flights like the Vomit Comet, or on observations in the very small sample size of our astronauts, all of whom started off in extraordinary physical condition. So there are a lot of unknowns. When we consider a future mission to Mars that lasts years, we need to consider whether there could be an as of yet unidentified association between microgravity and atherosclerosis, risk of venous thromboembolism, or long-term cognitive function. And as the Earth is about to experience the dawn of commercial spaceflight, we also need to consider the consequences of spaceflight on individuals much older and in worse physical condition than our current astronauts. As a field, space medicine has been around since before humans have reached space, but because of significant barriers to relevant experimentation, our knowledge is still in its infancy. The choice of topic for this video was not just because of the Apollo anniversary, but it's also part of a collaboration between a group of wonderful, like-minded education YouTubers, many of whom also put out videos today on the general theme of space. I'm going to put a link uh, to our communal playlist in this video's description. Please check out their videos too, and if you like them, consider subscribing. They are all awesome. And of course, thanks for watching.